but thanks guys for all turning out this morning. Like it's, uh, I mean, we, 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 we know most of I know most yeah. of you anyway, I'm not sure. If, yeah. I know a couple of people, there's some people obviously I haven't seen before, which is cool. And I've just met most of you today, or yesterday really. <laughs> Sorry, Angela, it's fine. <laughs> we can wait for you, it's all good. Yeah. Um, so guys, like, I think we're just gonna go ahead and start, and if anybody comes in afterwards, they can just join. So, um, yeah, myself, Nikki, and, and Peter, we was just about a month ago chatting about our passions and desires um, in regards to Divine Truth, and we were just like, right, let's get going, we've got to start creating stuff. Uh, well, not we've got to do, we just felt like we, we really wanted to do it. It was the right yeah. thing to do, it was the right time. So, like, we just felt. And we came up with it quite spontaneously, the date really, didn't we? We just said, should, yeah. we, should we go for it in about a month's time? And mm -hmm. here we are now. Yeah, we were all just sat in my, in my living room. And uh, we just said, right, let's do it in a month. And then it was like, right, let's do it, let's set the date. And the next day, kind of, we, we'd been in this venue before uh, for Jesus and Mary Talks, which Angela and Peter uh, helped organise. Um, so that was good, because we had a venue in mind. Um, and then the next step was to kind of get all the equipment. Um, so, so Nikki did a yeah, lot of research. That was a real yeah. arduous process. Um, I mean, I, I knew nothing about cameras, sound equipment, so I had to research all of that and then look at what was compatible with what. And, and it's a lot like, of testing. Yeah, a lot of testing we've had to do in a little flat. So. Um, so yeah, we've had to go through quite a bit of a process already to get to this point. Um, but yeah, it seems like everything's working out okay, and mm -hmm. the sound's working, so, so yeah, let's crack on. Yeah, so we're all absolutely totally excited. We've just been buzzing for the last few days. Um, just cause, because we have, so some of you might have seen the YouTube channel already, so that's been quite a, a new experience for us. And like, we, we go through lots of different emotions like when we're filming. Um, like nerves in the first time and then some fees come up. So it's been a really awesome uh, experiment on going through our desires and then feeling the fears which come up. Um, and so we just kept going. So the next logical step for us was to start presenting seminars and then it was like, oh, public speaking, feelings coming up and all stuff like that. And um, so it was like, great, more fears to challenge. And um, so we're just kind of like dead excited to use this seminar, not just for you guys, or for people who are watching on YouTube, but also it's an experiment for us. Um, and also and just, it's going to be good for people abroad as well. So, yeah. Um, people and, who are overseas can see what's, what's happened here and um, yeah, just give access to everyone else. And just sort of on that note, um, I know that quite a, few, quite a few guys are already familiar with Divine Truth and, and things, but just as part of this intro, we're just going to quickly talk about exactly what it is, um, just as much for the benefit of the people that watch it later, basically. And so we're going to run through that quickly at the start as well. So, so we, um, oh yeah, but let's outline kind of how the format of the talk is going to go. So we're just going to do like a few minutes of introduction of each other personally, um, even though some of you guys know us already, but a bit more in depth as we um, express ourselves more. And then once we've done that, we're going to each take turns just to present a little topic on the introduction to Divine Truth that we're passionate about. And then we're going to take like a five minute break just to go to the toilet. And then after that, we're going to have questions and answers. Uh, and you can basically, if you just keep it on topic, because um, some of the stuff that is related to divine truth, we haven't experienced, but, but we feel pretty comfortable in the stuff that we're presenting today. So does that sound all right? All good? Cool. 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 Yeah, so just a couple of things. Um, if anyone needs to go to the toilet in between, um, yeah, actually, it's fine because everyone's behind the camera. So, um, so yeah, <laughs> just, uh, just, just go, yeah, yeah, just, go. <laughs> just go, just <laughs> go, don't worry about the cameras, um, and uh, yeah, that's all we, that's it really, um, yeah, oh yeah, with the mics as well, uh, there'll be one mic that'll uh, go round, oh yeah, the Roman mic, which is, whereabouts is, it's just there, on the it's there on the chair, cool, um, I'm going to leave that with Phil, if, uh, if yeah. it needs to be passed around, sorry, right. yeah, um, so you do have to hold it. <laughs> you literally do have to hold it right close to your mouth to be able to, to hear it loudly. Um, which, if you've watched the seminars before, you'll see Jesus and Mary constantly saying, "It is hold the up. It's like an inch from, from Perry's mouth right now, you know, and that's uh, any further than that, you won't hear it really. 
pretty cool. So, yeah, exactly. So it's, uh, it's a bit uncanny. So, um, so cool. Yeah. That's for you. Cool. Do you want to yeah, introduce I'll start. yourself? So, uh, hi guys, I'm Nicky and I am 26 years old. I was born in a city called Derby, uh, central England. And I guess throughout my life, I've, I've been just like a regular guy, really. <laughs> went to school, went to university, hung out with friends, played a lot of sports, um, loved music, films, just like the regular stuff. And, um, and yeah, I ended up going to university and I studied sports science just because I was so passionate about sports, and I still am. Um, and so I went to study that in Nottingham. And um, I guess I kind of, like when I finished uni, I, I was kind of not sure what I was actually going to do with my life. Um, I kind of wanted to go into sports, but then I was, it was really hard to get a job because that's when like, the recession was quite intense at the time. And um, I ended up basically finding myself a very temporary recruitment position uh, in central London, which I stayed in for about 11 months. And very quickly in that uh, job, I realised I didn't want to do it much longer. Um, like it's like a salesy kind of job, and um, they basically encourage you to kind of like bend the truth or lie, <laughs> essentially. Um, so um, I left that job, and then I ended up getting into the finance sector, and I worked firstly for uh, Lords Banking Group. And then I moved over to Nationwide in Northampton, which I stayed there for around three years. And in that time when I was at Nationwide is when I basically first came across Divine Truth. And this was in July 2013. Um, basically at the time, just to give like a, a brief overview, um, I got to this point where I don't know where it really came from. I just started feeling in my heart about God. I didn't really ask myself the question about whether God existed or, or not, and then what God was actually like. So um, this kind of feeling came up, and I was quite lucky in the sense that work, there were a lot of uh, people of a Christian faith, there were a lot of people of a Muslim faith, and so what I did was I kind of just asked everyone at work about what their beliefs were, and I kind of built a good kind of picture up about what they who they felt God was, uh, who they felt Jesus was. And, um, and yeah, I mean, I got to a point where I just got like really confused because I, <laughs> I realized that like I could be missing a massive part of my whole life here. Like if God does exist, I could have been living my life just, you know, like a completely, I won't say incorrect way, but like an ignorant almost way. And, I just had to know the truth about God. I just had to have got to a point where it was just so like intense for me. I just had to know. And that then leads me to basically, um, I remember one night when I was at home, I, um, I was just so confused and it was said out loud at this point, I didn't even know if God existed. And I just said in my, in my bedroom, I said, like, God, if you exist, please show me your truth. I just want to know your truth so much. And obviously I didn't know what would happen um, after that. I didn't even know if that was actually prayer or, you know, I had no idea. And, um, and then within a week, <laughs> I uh, basically came across Divine Truth. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it was the most special time of my life, really. Um, it was like, it was an awesome lead up to actually discovering Divine Truth in the sense of my guide, he was, um, it was kind of like pointing me in the direction of Jesus and I was kind of getting confused I was thinking oh um, like maybe Christianity is the truth and I was getting a bit confused but well, then when I spoke with my cousin Pete um, who he's been going through similar experiences that I was at the time um, we basically yeah ended up coming to divine truth and then from July 2013 to now, we've kind of been practicing the principles that Jesus and Mary teach as best as possible, as, as, as well as we can actually understand them now. And yeah, we've just been basically, um, yeah, putting everything into practice. 
living as much as we can in truth and feeling obviously our, our emotions whenever they do come up and um, and yeah I guess this is where, where we are now mm -hmm. so uh, that's just a little bit about me. Do you want to go Barry? Or do you go next? Yeah. yeah. Um, well you all know who I am, Perry, and um, I've also met a lot of you at some of the talks in the past at Jesus and Mary's. Um, but I'll share a little bit more in depth on how I got into Divine Truth. So I first came across it, um, I guess, when I was around 30, so I'm 38 now. I started getting into kind of wanting to take care, take better care of myself. Um, so I was very much into the bar culture before that, so in, in, all through my 20s. So I was drinking quite a bit, uh, partying, um, alcohol, drugs, just kind of living a reckless life, eating what I wanted to eat. Um, I guess a saving grace was used to, I used to like love just like physical exercise, so I was always working out and training uh, one way or another. So I kind of guess I always had like this feeling inside of me that I wanted to like better myself um, physically. And then through kind of like my mid 20s, um, I remember uh, a relationship broke up just because I was just such a mess basically. Um, and I just really didn't like myself at all. And I just had this feeling, I was just thinking to myself, I was like, yeah, I remember my, um, like, my dad and my grandparents feeling this way because I'd heard stories, um, Chinese whispers in the family. And I was just like, for some reason, if I don't clean myself up, if I have children in the future, I just know I'm going to pass this down the line. And I was like, I really don't want to do that. And I came to that conclusion just on my own. I was, I was 26. But I didn't do too much about it. I just started to read um, self-help books. And I was like, oh, it's actually, there's, a, there's a thing out there about improving yourself. Like I never realized before because I've just been stuck in bartender books. Um, and so I just got really interested in books like um, anything to do with self-help. And then slowly, like, spiritual books would come through, um, especially stories like uh, the Paolo Coelho series of books, uh, who was one of my favorite authors. And I started to read a ton of his books. I think The Alchemist was the one that I read. Um, and then there was, like, The Celestine Prophecies. So I started to get into all these uh, books which were talking about, like, different realities, different ways of living, and energies, and all these things. So that took me up to about, up to about 30. And I was still working in the bars at the time. And then just at one point, I was just like, I've got to get out of this industry. Like, it's just, I'm just really not enjoying it. I'm not, I'm not happy at all. And I still had like this underlying like depression going on all the time. I just felt like I wasn't living the life that I thought of when I was a kid. Like, I was like, this can't be life. I was like, okay, so things have got to change. Um, so I just quit the bars. And what I did, I did a, a seven day water fast. And um, after that, I just automatically became vegetarian. Like I didn't want to eat meat no more. And I didn't know why. So I'd left my job, left some of the booze, not all of it. I was still having a little drink now and again. But I'd done this, this water fast. I don't know if I'd recommend doing a water fast now. But um, <laughs> seven days not eating, it was pretty <laughs> intense. Um, and it was definitely life changing. Because I was just like, I don't want to put meat into my body. So I started to educate myself on on vegetarian lifestyle, and that quickly ran into veganism and then the raw vegan lifestyle. <laughs> um, I'm just laughing now because the next thing I'm going to say, I went to this place called the Tree of Life, which is in Arizona, and I'm laughing because Courtney, who's behind the camera, that's where <laughs> we met years ago, and um, this was a, like a, it was a, a, a spiritual rejuvenation center, and it had a few different disciplines in there, um, but I came across some books about Jesus or what they perceived as what Jesus was living like. And I just remember thinking, I really want to be like Jesus. Like this dude just sounds awesome. Like just everything he does just sounds amazing. He's like the most loving guy ever. Um, I was just like so, not obsessed wasn't the word, but just kind of like, I, I had this like aspiration of just like, if it could, if you could be like Jesus, then that would just be the best thing ever. Um, and then a few years went by, and then a friend of mine sent me a YouTube seminar and said, just watch this. And um, I was like, okay, fair enough. And I just watched the, um, what is it called? The um, Secrets of the Universe, part one. And after watching it, I was just like, yep, 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 yep. Everything this guy's saying. I don't know if it's Jesus, but everything he's saying just seems absolutely true. And I was so full of joy. Um, and I just watched all four seminars back to back. I was like, oh, all night watching them. 
and then that was like five years ago. And then so since then, I've like attended seminars, uh, met Jesus a few times, had some personal feedbacks, uh, crashed and made a ton of mistakes, got back on my feet, <laughs> carried on. Um, and then at one point, um, Mary wrote me an email and said, I've just met a couple of lovely lads at the Australian Assistance Group, maybe you'd like to get in touch with them. And that was uh, these two. <laughs> and um, so I got them an email, and then eventually, after one from another, um, we got in, in touch, and Nikki had resided to come and move down to London. Yeah. And um, whilst he was looking for a place, I stayed at my place. Still at my place. <laughs> <laughs> Which is really great because we get to do those videos together and stuff. And uh, so now, yeah, I'm just uh, wanted to continue my passions and then hopefully progress closer and closer to God. So that's me. Awesome. Um, so, yeah, hi guys, my name's Peter. I'm 26 years old. I grew up in the same city as Nikki. We're both cousins. Uh, and yeah, I had a relatively normal upbringing, I'd say. Um, I had no religious background. I didn't have any religious beliefs growing up, and uh, neither of my parents were religious. I did the relatively normal things that you would probably picture a young lad doing. You know, I played a lot of sport, was very, uh, just very interested in hanging out with mates all the time, playing various different sports. As I got older, you know, girlfriends and partying came into the equation, and yeah, it was just having fun, really, I guess, for, uh, for the first part of my life. And then, I ended up going to Manchester University when I was 18 years old um, to study business management. And that turned out to just be an enormous continuation of the partying, uh, <laughs> you know, multiplied by five. Uh, so that was three years really of uh, just, I don't know how to describe it, just reckless behaviour, you know, drinking, drugs, just anything and everything basically. Um, and then eventually I ended up moving down to London straight after university pretty much. I had a brief stint in Singapore, but that was only for a few months. So I came back to London around, I want to say, I want to say September 2011 or October 2011, sometime around then. And uh, yeah, so I got a job working at a place where Nikki had uh, shown, well, kind of shown me the, uh, the opportunity. So it was with Lloyds Banking Group. And at this same time, just after finishing uni, was I'd been on holiday to Montenegro with uh, with a couple of my friends and had fallen head over heels for uh, for this girl. And this this was an ongoing thing. I'd met her a good number of years ago, uh, but we'd only been friends. And then things changed that summer, and it really grabbed a hold of me. Like when I say I fell hard, I fell hard, you know. Uh, and she happened to live on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. Canada, so you know it's, uh, it wasn't the easiest logistic. So I was I was back here in London, desperately wanting to see this girl, and just generally being a bit peeved up by the whole situation. That I was then I was working a job that for the first few months was okay, but I soon realised that I didn't want to be caught up in this rat race for too long, and that this wasn't how I wanted to spend the next four years of my life, like just battling in the city um, just for money. And at the same time, I was very frustrated by the fact that I was working, you know, probably nine to six or something, and had very few holiday days, had no real time to potentially even go out and see this girl. So as time went by and the year, the, the year progressed, I really got to this point where I was like, no, I've got to do something about this. I need to, I need to, I need to go home. I need to create a business. It needs to be, uh, it needs to be online so that I can do it from anywhere in the world so that I'm not held down to one location. And I ended up leaving that job in London. It was exactly a year to the day after I started it. So I was there for one year, hung around in London for maybe a few more months as we still had our tenancy on the flat, and then moved back home to Derby with this, uh, with this idea to set up this health and fitness business uh, with a good friend of mine back home. So I went ahead and started that, and uh, things, things, were going, things were going quite well to be good. And we were excited, we were planning a lot of things, and I'd also booked a holiday with Nikki and maybe five or six of our other friends from back home at the time to Thailand. And this was for like this was for the summer of 2013. And as this holiday was approaching, it, you know, it was planned very much to be a typical lads' holiday, seven guys or, or whatnot, going out there drinking loads, partying, hitting up the bullying parties. That was exactly what was on the agenda. And I felt like I was at this point where 
I just had to make something work, both with the business and uh, this relationship with the girl at the time. So as the holiday was like drawing nearer and nearer, I kind of got this sense that I probably, I probably shouldn't go. This wasn't the, uh, it wasn't the right time for me to go out there and party again. Like I've done enough partying this past four years. Like come on, get serious. And I made the decision to, uh, to stay. I'd already paid for the flights and things, which were quite expensive. And I remember a few of the lads weren't too pleased when I pulled it out at first, but I felt like I had to do it for me. So I took them all to the airport and that left me these two weeks completely by myself in Derby. Pretty much all my friends were out there in Thailand and I was just backed up into a corner uh, with this business and this situation with this girl. And I thought, right, I've really got to do something right now. So that's exactly what I, I tried to do. Um, I was working like 16 hours, maybe more each day at my computer and then spending countless hours as well thinking about this situation with this girl. What do I do? What do I, how am I going you know, to make this work? X, Y, Z. And as the days went by, you know, I just wasn't sleeping. It, I really felt like I, I just had to do something big. And in the end, a couple of little things happened uh, with the girl. Like, and it just reached this point where I decided, you know what, I, I'm, I can't do this anymore. I'm just going to tell her exactly how I feel, like the absolute bluntest truth from the bottom of my heart. And I just wrote out this big long email. And as I did that, I sent it off. And the, you know, it, 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 I had a lot of fear about doing that. This was like two years, three years worth of like bottled up emotions that I'd maybe set the surface of, but nowhere near at the depths of them. And as I did it, I just had this enormous um, emotional release, I guess you'd say. And I, you know, I sat at the end, the end of my bed in my bedroom that I'd grown up in, and I was just reflecting on everything that had just sort of happened and the whole process of these two years. And, I was getting lots of like synchronous events happening to me at the time and as I reflected on it all, I just just completely just fell back on my bed, overwhelmed with this love entering from outside of myself and I, I had no idea at first as to what on earth this was. I just went with it, rolled back on my bed and just started crying my eyes out really and I, it maybe lasted for five minutes or so, it's tough to really say um, exactly how long at the time and I just sat up at the edge of my bed afterwards and the words just came straight out of my mind. Oh my God, God is real and I have a soulmate. And I was like, what? I was like, what, what am I saying? But I knew it to be true in my heart. My head had no way of processing this just yet. You know, like I said, I wasn't religious. I didn't have any particular faith. I had never, I never knew what a soulmate was. I perhaps heard it in movies, but I had no real context of uh, what that meant. And I just went on this crazy, um, crazy week that next week because I knew the things I felt were true. They were as real as the first time you feel the wind brush against your skin. And I just had to find what it was that explained this. And a week later I'd just moved into my own house back home in Derby and I think it was on my first night there, perhaps the second. And I'd gone to bed about 3 4 a.m. which was not very normal for me at the time. And about 7 a.m. I just snapped up out of bed and woke up. And didn't think anything about it. This was at 7 a.m. and just strolled on downstairs and sat myself in my second lounge, like this small uh, little room that we had. And I just flipped on the TV. I wasn't. I didn't even think about any of this. It was. I had no idea why I was even up. <laughs> just sat down, and the next words I heard were coming out of Eamon Holmes' mouth. Uh, <laughs> and the, uh, the next guest that we have on today says that he is uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus Christ, and his, uh, his girlfriend here is Mary Magdalene. So welcome, guys. And I was there, like, just freaking out. <laughs> and paid pretty close attention. And yeah, I had a, to be honest, I had a very strong sense immediately that what I was about to see was, was true. And of course, I did go on a, a little process as well of then like watching the first few videos and hearing that way actually had to say. But yeah, I was pretty uh, pretty sure I found what I was looking for right at the uh, right at that moment. And yeah, so after that, it's just been a similar journey to uh, to Nikki and Perry in terms of just trying to start to actually get to grasps with some of these truths and uh, and put them into practice. And that's been very challenging at times and. But at the same time, when it's gone, when it's gone well, it's been really great and really rewarding. So, yeah, here we are now, and uh, just looking forward to presenting this first seminar. So, yeah, that's me, guys. Cool. So, 
Now you know us. <laughs> a little bit more. Um, yeah, so now we're going to actually just like... The thing is, we didn't know who was going to turn up today. So we like prepared for it anyway. And then like we're just going to see what happened. So obviously we're looking around and we can see that a lot of you guys may know some of the principles of the divine truth anyway. But we're just going to go ahead. Um, we've actually time and we've got our slots in time just to kind of keep it um, on sync and, and moving forward. So we've got about 12 to 15 minutes each. I'm just looking at the time. Yeah. Um, and we're just going to present, like I said in the beginning, just what we're passionate about. And then, then we'll have a break and afterwards you can just ask all the questions. Yeah. So I can see like there are some people who we don't know here as well, so that'll be really good. Well, I feel it's good for me actually to to kind of present and um, you know, so yeah. yeah. Cool. So I guess first things first is um, explain to people what divine truth is. So <laughs> so um, for the benefit of see uh, people who here who may not know uh, about Divine Truth and also people on YouTube who are not sure. Uh, divine Truth is basically, uh, to put it in a nutshell, a spiritual path that was taught originally 2,000 years ago uh, by Jesus and the whole teaching is related to how we can all personally um, develop and build our relationship with God. and. When I say God, I am basically relating to a being, just as I'm a being, Peter being, crazy being. You guys, obviously, we're all individuals. And God is exactly the same from my personal experience. And with regards to God, um, this is weird drawing the little circle. <laughs> I've never done this before, so. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah. yeah. So, so I've come to the personal truth um, and awareness that God is a being, and also that God is the parent of all of us. God is the creator of the universe, the creator of all of us, and. Uh, God, basically, I've realised how much God would like a personal relationship with each and every single one of us, um, just because of my personal experiences with this being. Um, and so far in my life, um, it has been the most unbelievable relationship ever. Like, nothing can compare to how awesome God is, basically. Um, so, God has many attributes, many qualities, uh, some being um, generosity, compassion, kindness, patience, etc, etc. And as you can see, they're all really awesome qualities to have. Like, there's nothing in there that says God is angry, God is wrathful, God is vengeful, uh, God wants to strike us all down. Um, they're all really awesome qualities that everyone would love to have. And with regards to God, there are actually two main attributes that God has, two really important attributes. And the first is, um, truth and second is love um, now when I refer to truth and love I refer to absolute truth and absolute love and because God is a perfect being this is this therefore means that God and God created us all it means God must know all truth and God also must be perfect in love basically and what I've found in my um, personal relationship with God so far, um, 
the little I have learned is that um, receiving God's divine love is the most amazing experience ever. But I remember the first time I received it, um, I was, I, I kind of was like, this was five months into um, coming across Divine Truth and watching the videos. And I just got to a point where I just felt like, I just have to know now if actually AJ um, is Jesus and Mary is Mary Magdalene. Because I was ready to just change my whole life after five months. I was just there, I was just watching all the teachings and I was just so sure in my heart that what they were saying was true. So, um, I basically, one night, I locked myself in my room pretty much and I said to myself, I'm not leaving this room until I get an answer. <laughs> until I get an answer about Jesus and Mary and, and also about God and, want, and seeing if this love did exist and if it was possible for us to all receive it. And so I sat down on the end of my bed and I just said out loud, I said, God, if you truly exist and if you do have love that you would like to give me um, and also if AJ is Jesus, if Mary is Mary Magdalene, please may I receive the gift of your love. And before I even finished that, I was instantly flooded with the most like immense feeling. It almost felt like my whole body was going to explode. It was that intense and it was just like, I was getting a mixture of feelings. It was like a mixture of pure joy because what I've since learned is that you can only receive God's love when you're in truth at the same time. So and that's one thing I learned in that experience. And I realized as this experience was, was going that the, basically the answer to my prayer was that all of them, all of it's true. Everything I just prayed to God about was true. And there was a lot of sadness as well at the same time. Um, and the sadness was revolving around how in my life up to that point I like wasn't even aware of any of this I kind of lived my life quite blindly um, and also just realising that there is a parent that we all have, that we all share that actually does love us so much um, and just waiting for all of us to open our hearts up to actually asking God um, and wanting God in our lives. So, um, so yeah, I mean, that's the basics of, about God that I've learned so far. Um, I guess what I like to talk about is just like the goodness of God that I've experienced, I know is true from my personal experience. And, like, it's, it's almost weird in a way because every time that I've been grateful enough to receive God's love, I've been in total shock every time. <laughs> I just thought, like, it just comes in as I was going through, like, um, usually I go through, like, um, a certain type of emotion. It's usually sadness. And at the same time, I could feel my guide, um, like, just giving me the feeling, just pray to God now, ask God for love, ask God for love, ask God for love. And, um, and so that's all what I did, I just followed, followed that guidance and followed what Jesus and Mary actually teach. And, um, and yeah, I mean, it comes in and even though I ask and I know it is there, I'm still always in complete shock afterwards. <laughs> um, I don't know why, but um, it's probably related to uh, feelings of unworthiness I have uh, quite deeply actually. Um, so, um, so yeah. Um, it's like God has this tendency where when your heart is open to receiving God's love, God doesn't just give you one thing. <laughs> God gives you tons of things at the same time. And it's like God knows exactly what you would love to know and love to hear from God. And he, God just literally just gives you as much as, as God can in that time frame when your heart is open and you have that connection. Um, so for example, <laughs> um, once I, I basically started to have this feeling in me that this is what I want to do my whole life is 
share the truth that I have experienced with other people because I know how much it's changed my life, I know how amazing it all is. Um, and I started having this feeling and I kind of, I, I was in prayer to God and, and by the way, when I say prayer, you don't have to kind of go to a church or, you know, like a, a mosque or some, you know, like establishment. It's literally, you can pray anywhere. And uh, it so happened, this was when I was in the gym. <laughs> I went off to the, to the toilets and uh, I just felt, I felt so, so much desire in that moment that I just asked God, uh, God, like, I feel I want to teach this to people. Uh, I feel this is what I'm, this is who I am. Um, and then I asked God if God could like help me out basically. And, um, and yeah, while I was in that prayer, I was receiving some more God's love and I could feel that like God was telling me this is actually who I am. Like this is part of my nature, part of my soul and obviously the soul that God created. And at the same time, which is really like random, I, um, I kind of received confirmation about that part of my actual own soul. But also, I received this secondary truth about myself, and that was that God just, I got this feeling from God, and what happens is when you receive God's love and, and, and truth comes, it's like this, like you just automatically know like loads of things about God, and, and also these other truths about yourself and others. So I basically got this truth about myself that I've got a gift with music, and my whole life I've never played any instrument, I've, I've always loved listening to music and, and whatnot, but I've never actually played it. And I know why now, and that's because of certain um, like errors I still have in my soul about learning um, new things really, learning like instruments particularly, um, coming, like certain injuries coming from my dad um, that I've never actually taken the time to actually go through the learning process. So, um, that's just a bit of an example about like how awesome God is in the sense that God will give you more than what you've even asked for. And, and it's like when you receive the love from God, you realise how much you hadn't been loved in your whole life before that point. And, um, and yeah, I mean, it obviously does create a lot of grief. But also, when you come out of the experience, you feel so much better in your heart. You have this peace that lasts for, for a couple of days. Um, and yeah, it is literally just like the most amazing substance and feeling I've ever received. Um, so that's why I want to share it so much with others. Um, so um, let me just have a quick look. Notes. Yeah, so with, with God, you, when you choose to connect to God, then it is a choice because God's also given us the gift of free will. Um, you, so many things are added to you, stuff that you didn't even know before um, about the universe by itself. And, um, and yeah, I mean, it's, it is just it is just a beautiful thing and this is a real broad like overview as to like my relationship with this being God. Um, and yeah that's just what I want to share with you guys today. So um, so yeah. Thanks mate. Thanks mate. Get out of your way. Mate, that was awesome. Yeah, I just wanted to say then, as Nicky was chatting, I got really emotional. Like, I could have cried like a few times because I know what it's talking about. And I remember the first time that I'd received God's love as well. So I uh, almost broke down and left with some tears there. Mate, you rubbed the dive in my hand with that. <laughs> Get some practice in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to rub this out as well. <laughs> I'm just keeping a, a check on the time as well because we've got there's so much that you can talk about 
and we've got like 12 minutes to do it. Obviously, if you've seen Jesus and Mary stand out, they do like 12 hours on the subject, and more even. So it's, um, it's been a little bit tricky for us to like kind of condense what we feel would be like the most important thing we could share that you could take away with you. Um, especially for some people who haven't come across this before, there's maybe one or two around. Um, and you'll be able to ask all the questions and the question and answers. So what Nikki was just chatting then uh, was about God, which is just such a massive, massive subject. Um, and Nikki talked about like God is, is, a, is a soul. And if you remember, he was talking about receiving God's love. And so it's kind of then the next question as well, where is that love going into? And this is like, for me, it's just like one of the major, major, major kind of like misconceptions about um, spirituality on the planet at the moment and that's like understanding that we that we are a soul and um, I, I've kind of like followed so many different teachings in the past spiritual teachings and learn and come across so many different things you know kind of like as I said like uh, either just like self-development on your own or kinds of things like um, I've done like the Buddhist teachings I've done um, yoga teachings, um, so many, I can't even remember, Chinese medicine, all sorts of stuff, but no one ever really talked about um, the soul. Maybe they'd mention it, but not go into too much detail. And um, they talked a lot, and I mean a lot heavily, about the mind and using your mind to change yourself. And so I kind of went down that road for, I don't know, a good 10 years. I can't tell you how many affirmations I wrote about becoming rich and then went bankrupt, so that didn't work. <laughs> so much paper wasted. Uh, <laughs> so I was thinking, yeah, these, this affirmation stuff doesn't work. Like it worked a little bit, like it might perk me up for like an hour and I felt like quite buoyant. Like, yes, I am abundant and money's going to flow to me. And then someone gave me an apple. I was like, that was why. It's because I'm feeling abundant, but like, it didn't really change any long-lasting <laughs> effects. And I just couldn't work it out and I was so frustrated thinking, how, how does long-lasting change happen? And then I think I then maybe came across like NLP and like, I can't remember what it stands for, Neurological Programming. That's the one. Um, so I tried a bit of that and then a bit of the tapping techniques and stuff. So I was like saying an affirmation and tapping on different parts of my body. Like I don't want to offend anyone if anyone does that, but for me, like just nothing happened. I just felt like an idiot that I was just <laughs> tapping all these different parts of my body. Um, now I do know that there, there are energy pathways in the body. Like I learned that in the Chinese medicine. And um, Jesus also explains about chakras and all these things. So there were truths through all these different things that I'd learned. Um, but I felt like something was missing. And like I said in my intro, when I saw Jesus present, I was like, these are all the bits that were missing. And, um, and so how, how I started to learn and like knowing my heart what he was saying was true, um, was just by, that's <laughs> Bex. Um, I just started to, like Nick was saying, like just experiment with the process that um, Jesus was explaining. You mentioned Jesus was called AJ. I, for, I, I forgot he was called AJ. <laughs> just because I'm so used to calling him Jesus now, like it's so normal. Um, just because of like the feelings that I've been through, and um, yeah, I, I, for, I forgot he was called AJ. So when AJ used to present, uh, I thought, right, I've just got to start practicing what 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 he's saying to understand in my heart if this is true or not. And um, what happened with myself was like. A little, a little bit less than like Nikki. Like Nikki had like this discovery, and I was just like depressed and a mess. And I was just like, I can't live like this any longer. So something's got to change. And uh, I think I'd just been to a talk where we were actually um, at someone's house having dinner, and Jesus and Mary there. They were over from England, and I had a chat with Jesus, and I was just like, man, tomorrow morning I just got to go off, and I've got to just start praying sincerely because obviously I'm not and not, my life wasn't changing, it felt like it was getting worse. I'm like, man, I've been listening to this stuff for, like, like for a year or so and nothing's happening. Same problems happening, relationship problems still happening, still no self-confidence, still self-doubt, still felt absolutely shit about myself. Um, I, can't, 
I can't even explain to you how much of a mess I was in and how much I loathed myself. Like it was just horrendous. Um, and so what happened was I, I got back to my back to my flat where I was staying at the time, and I was in such turmoil. And like Nikki, like I was just my, my prayer was just my own words, like nothing. You know, it wasn't like a special any special words. It was just my heart was open to God. I was like God, and even now I'm thinking. I can feel like in the emotions because of just how amazing it was. Um, like, like you hear the word, like it was saved by God, and um, in that moment, like I literally saved. Like I felt like I'd been saved by God. Um, and yeah, I was watching. Um, I watched this like little YouTube clip, and I just felt like all this love coming to my heart for the first time in my life. <laughs> like, I, like I felt love. And it was just incredible. Um, and and the other thing was like, I felt my soul for the first time. And then I was just like in so much pain. I'll get through this. It's like a wedding speech, and then when the best man starts crying. And so I felt my soul for the first time, and I realised that I had a soul. And um, that's what I'm going to talk about now. Uh, it's about your soul. Um, and what happened was in the beginning, like, I didn't feel the full truth of it. Like, in the beginning, I just felt like, uh, like I had a soul. No, how did I feel in the beginning? Yeah, I had it. Like, I thought I had one. I didn't think I was one. And um, so I, I just got this huge sensation of, like, this, this, this soul relationship going on, all these emotions. And... Uh, and I spoke to Jesus about it one day. I was like, yeah, I had this like, huge open, heart opening. And I realized that I had a soul. And he was like, oh, well, there's, there's still a little bit of work to do there just by the language that you used. And I was like, oh, what do you mean? And he goes, well, you don't have a soul. You are a soul. And I was like, hmm? I didn't quite get, get it. I, I, I thought I'd felt through the, the, the ultimate truth. And then, um, and then only a few months ago, I was going, some, uh, just going through some grief about kind of like how I was treated as a kid. And there was, there was a gap, like the grief I was going through was kind of like, it was to do with like my dad paying attention to me. And what I felt was how, the gap was how my father treated me compared to how God would treat me. And I was just crying and crying and crying. And then, and then I was like, oh, when God was creating me, like God created me with so much joy and so much happiness. And it was just like, it was painting the picture and was just so excited about adding all these little details of my character. And it was just like, I could feel God creating me. And I was like, oh, God created me. Like, God created me. I, I am a soul. And I was like, oh, now I know what Jesus was talking about. It's like, I don't have a soul. I am actually a physical soul. And, um, and basically, this is just my body that I'm using in the physical world. So what I'm going to do now is, because we don't have too much to talk about, I'm just going to kind of like grossly explain kind of what the soul is and then what happens in, in incarnation and, and then the spiritual body and the physical body. So I know some of you know this, but I know some of you don't. So basically, the diagram that Nikki drew before... Oh, you'll have to draw again. <laughs> ...is you have God which is a soul, like here, yeah, pretty big. Uh, and God has masculine and feminine qualities. And so basically, just like very in simple terms, just as parents on earth at some point desire to have a child, that's what God did with us. It's like we just wanted to create uh, children. And so what God did was he created all these little souls, I'm going to put them over here, like mini -me's. Okay, and they also have masculine and feminine qualities. Almost done. Cool. So it's kind of like God gave birth to all these souls, so to speak. And um, like in this stage, 
all the souls are like unconscious, either unaware of themselves, like they don't even know they exist. And so the way to kickstart that process is like God wanted us to go out into the world and experience ourselves and like, you know, have this relationship with God like, like Nick explained. Um, it's like, well, okay, like, well, how does that happen? So what happens is you get some humans on earth uh, who see each other in a nightclub, fancy each other, and uh, they end up getting in a relationship, and then uh, over time, um, they fall in love, and then they start to have a desire, they're like, oh, should we have some kids? And then uh, they think, yeah, that's a good idea, let's, let's have a child. Uh, so that's what we know in the physical world, and we don't know that this is going on. We just think that we want to have kids, like, not really that aware of why, um, or how. Or, <laughs> yeah, or how the whole person, we just know what happens physically. Um, so, basically, what happens is, you have two human couples, a male and a female. Go get the skirt right. Okay. And what happens is, they uh, obviously make love and they desire a child. And as you all know, what happens is, they will have a little baby. I'm going to draw a little baby like this. I'm going to draw a male. So, that's what happens physically. But what was happening on a spiritual level is that one of these little souls here was able to then incarnate into this little baby here. And what happens is, this whole soul, this is what we call a whole soul, um, kind of like what's called splits and so half of the soul is going to incarnate into this little baby or create this baby should I speak should I say um, so now this half of the soul which was predominantly male has now created a physical body which we see every day that's what's going on but one of the things that we often don't see is that our physical body also has what's called a spiritual body and basically it's almost a carbon copy of our physical self so if you were in the spirit world you could look in the mirror and you would be able to recognize yourself pretty much and and so we've seen it before we have kind of like this invisible so to speak spirit body which is next to us and um, that's a whole other discussion as well so i'm just trying to Give you the basics and you can ask him the questions and answers about this relationship of what's going on so just to recap we were a whole soul that was totally unaware of ourselves there were a couple of parents on earth who desired to have a child the lady got pregnant and then you see what happens nine months later a little baby pops out but it's not just a little baby it also has the spiritual body that we're talking, which is on the side, that we can't see. And not many people in any spiritual practices um, tend to consider, really. Um, what I found in my spiritual journey, a lot of people would say there was a physical body and then there was a spiritual body. But they didn't really talk much about the soul. And in a lot of the philosophies, they would say, okay, you can heal and change yourself by changing your spirit body. And in, in a way that's a little bit true, but it's not the whole truth. So there's a lot of kind of healing philosophies now, like uh, Chinese medicine, acupunctures, Reiki, uh, energy healing. I, I guess that's the term they call it, energy healing. And, and basically what they do is they'll use their own energy, or maybe an energy from another spirit, to heal the spirit body, which then will appear to heal the physical body. So I've done that in the past. Um, I've gone to an acupuncturist, I had a problem. He gave me some Chinese medicine. Uh, a month later, this rash that I had disappeared. I was like, wow, Chinese medicine works, that's awesome. So I, I studied Chinese medicine for a bit. Um, but then this rash came back a few years later. And I was like, oh. So I was like, so it hasn't healed it, like, totally. And 
So then I started to think, as I said to you before, I started to feel about this, you know, my soul. And this is what we call is the real self. And um, the real self is, it contains like all your emotions. So you saw my, I was getting a bit emotional before. That was all my emotions and all my feelings. I didn't think that I was going to do that. Um, it's just like naturally all these emotions just came to me and I just allowed myself to feel them. So, so that's what the soul is. So just before I digress too much, I'm going to talk about what happens to the other side of the soul. Because you might be thinking, well, if the other half is left up there, what's going on? So in this incarnation place, what happens is there's a period of time where another couple on earth, which I'll draw them, maybe over here, So, doesn't look like a woman or a man at all, but <laughs> you get the gist of it. <laughs> I will get better at my technical skills. Uh, so they also desire to have a child as well, kind of, you know, they get together, fall in love, make love, and then they create another baby over here. And this one's going to be a little baby girl. And then so basically, what happens is the, the, the attraction of the half of the soul is one of the strongest attractions that there is in existence. And so I think it's pretty much impossible. Well, I won't go into that. What happens is the, the attraction of the other half of the soul gets drawn into this little baby girl. And she will also have a little spirit body as well. Because we all have a spirit body, which is here. Um, so now it appears that you guys in the audience, you feel that you're, you are an individual, um, which you are. However, you're only one half of your soul. And uh, so the next question is, is like, well, how do you know who your other half is? And uh, that's a, a, a pretty big subject, which uh, I still haven't felt my way through, so I can't talk too much about that. But the basics are, you, like, for me, the, if I was to give you, like, or send a message, what's the most important thing is, like, to feel that you are a soul and that there is an other half of you and that your mind is just a tool that you can use to develop your soul uh, in love. And um, uh, Pete's going to talk about how you actually develop your soul. So once you've felt your soul and you've got, you've got your kit, it's like, well, well how do I use it? So you've got God and you've got your soul. So then how does this soul develop and grow in love? And um, yeah, that's what Pete's going to talk about now. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Perry. All right, I'm just going to rub this quickly off the board, if you don't mind me uh, spoiling your drawings. Mate. Right, so you can okay. do that. So yeah, like... Uh, like Perry just alluded to, um, what I'm going to talk to you about today, I'm just uh, take the pen please, thank you, is about growing in love and developing a relationship with God and what that actually entails in reality, with a focus on three main core elements, if you like, which are love, truth, and humility. So, you can think of love, truth, and humility as like the three cornerstones, if you like, to this relationship with God. They're, they really are the foundation and the building blocks. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and write one of my favourite quotes from Jesus on the board up here to start with, which is, truth. Now I can't remember exactly which video or when he said this, uh, or when it's from exactly, but one of you might be able to help point that out at some point. Truth open to heart so that love can flow. Apologies if my writing is bad. I'm not, uh, not too used to the whiteboard either. Um, but yeah, what I'd just encourage first of all for a moment is to just allow yourself to just consider that, that quote for a minute. Truth opens the heart so that love can flow. Does, it, does, it, does that have a deep meaning in your heart? Does it touch you in some way? Or are they just words on a page? Or a whiteboard in this instance? Um, so I'm just going to leave that up there whilst I uh, 
whilst I go through some of this talk. So love, we'll start with love. It's not easy to sum love up in, uh, in one or two minutes, but uh, I'll give it a go. So first things first, just to sort of get a little measure of where we're at. How many people here would say that they feel like in their heart that they know what love is? Like, would, would you raise your hand if you do, if you, if you feel that way? Like, a little bit? Like, yeah, so, not sure. No, that's pretty honest, I appreciate that. Like, well, uh, yeah, we wouldn't say fully myself either. No, exactly, that's, well, that's, yeah, that's, where I'm, that's what I'm sort of getting at. So we'll, we'll come back to that in a moment. You see, when we talk about love, it's the first thing we have to do is we have to be very clear what we're talking about here because there's the way that the world sees love and then there's the way that God sees love, which is how I'm suggesting that love really is. And the two are very, very, very different. Now, we've all grown up here on earth and we've been surrounded by the way that the world views love and that's something that's ever changing throughout history, it's you know, making ever so slight tiny progressions at times and more specifically we've grown up not just surrounded by the world's view of love but by our parents and the other people that are close to us, particularly in our upbringing, their views of love. So it's natural that we absorb some of these beliefs while we're, while we're growing up and that we start to actually believe that that's how love is. Now from God's perspective, love is a very different thing to what we see here on earth. So just as like a, a brief example of that, you can see how still in some cultures today on earth, some parents believe that it's a loving thing to, to beat their children if they've done something that they deem as naughty because they're going to perhaps beat the bad behaviour out of them and that they're not going to repeat the action. Now, never from God's perspective is that loving. Under no circumstance whatsoever is it, is it loving to hurt another person. So. You could say that just one aspect of God's love, if you like, is that when you attract an experience, like a parent with a child doing something that frustrates them, when you attract any sort of experience that triggers emotions inside of you, rather than trying to deflect them emotions onto the other people, what you will try and do is, depending on the emotion, you, you will just allow it to flow. So if it's grief, you'll, you'll go and, and allow yourself to cry your eyes out. If it's, if, if it's, if it's anger, then again, you have, to, you have to allow it to flow, but in a loving manner. So, you know, you're not gonna go and start a fight with somebody. What you'll do is you might go and scream into a pillow or take it out of the punch bag and, uh, and go a few rounds with that. Let, let the emotion flow, but in a loving way. And that, that's a really important like, distinction to remember. Now, I don't have nearly enough time to talk about all the different aspects of uh, the way that God loves, and we don't have enough time here today. We could do a whole seminar on just that. But if there's one thing about love that I would try and draw your attention to, it would be to remember that God's view of love is very different to the way that the world views love here. And if you want to develop this relationship with God, it's going to be about trying to bring your views on love closer and more in harmony towards God's views and feel the way that God does about love. So I would sort of set my intention and my target to try and every time I'm triggered emotionally and something comes up, to try and allow myself to feel through them things and consider and ask what would, what would God's uh, truth on love be at this moment? What would be the loving action to do? And try and take that action, no matter how much it challenges you. And in fact, particularly when it challenges you, because that's really when the most growth occurs. So yeah, that's, uh, that's love for now. So in fact, going back to the question that I asked quickly about how many of us feel that we know what love truly is, like Nikki briefly pointed out, like, I'm not sure that I would say I'm anywhere near yet. Uh, there yet myself. Really, I'd say that we only truly know what love is when we have God's ways or God's laws of love written across our heart, meaning that we would never take any action any indifferently to them, and we would always act that way. So, let's move on to truth, and obviously I want to talk to you about God's truth. Now, you may hear God's truth referred to as absolute truth or divine truth as well, uh, and we're talking about the same thing here. I guess I'll start by defining divine truth. Does, uh, does anybody at all want to give this a go? Or anybody fancy uh, giving me a definition or shall I go with it? Any hands? No? Yeah, just you. Right? Oh, just me. <laughs> no worries. Okay, so divine truth. Divine truth, I may just say this because it'll take me ages to write it and I'm sure on time. But divine truth is God's ultimate truth about the universe that we live in. It's absolute, 
It's existed way before humankind and it will continue to exist for all eternity. It exists on every single topic, scenario and situation there is. And yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's eternal, like I said. So there's a few qualities to divine truth. It's, it's always loving, it never compromises, it's eternal, and there's many, many more that, again, I could go on to list, but I want to try and draw your attention to, again, a few more important things that I think I can get out in this one lesson. So, for those of you who do decide, or that already are pursuing this relationship with God, you'll know, or you'll come to learn, that the more you progress with it, you're going to continually learn new truths and have them uh, added to you along the way, like Nikki described with uh, his journey and stuff at the gym and the musical things. So. What I would encourage you is, rather than, basically what I would encourage you to do is to, is to put your focus on trying to learn God's truth about love, because it's kind of easy to get carried away, perhaps um, wanting to learn lots of truths about the universe and lots of metaphysical things, and it's not that they're not important, they're, they're interesting, but they're not going to form the backbone of your relationship with God. For that, you need to focus on learning the truth about love. So again, when you find yourself in those difficult scenarios, try and think back to, you know, what would God's truth be on this instant, and with reference to love in particular. Now, like I've said, God's truth exists on every single subject and all different scenarios. So, you know, you might find yourself in a situation whereby yourself and a friend have quite polarizing views on something and you each believe that you know the truth. Well, the reality is that only, only one of you can, or perhaps both of you are wrong, and the truth is something entirely different. Because there is only one absolute truth. So, what this whole process is about is again, like I mentioned with love, it's about bringing yourself closer and more in harmony with God's truth, rather than our own personal truths that we have at the moment. An example I can think of with this that I've been through myself is uh, just shortly after first finding divine truth. I'd always grown up like really into sport and the gym and health and fitness and stuff. And I was one of these dudes who ate loads of, uh, loads of meat and drank loads of protein shakes basically. And um, I had like a, an old friend from uh, when I used to do breakdancing that had always kind of followed his journey and he'd gone on uh, a little journey um, as a top athlete in doing free running and parkour. And to, to sum it up quickly, he basically eventually turned vegan. And this was maybe a year before I found Divine Truth. And to begin with, I looked at that and sort of thought, well, I was like, how is he going to perform as a top athlete? What's he doing? This is not going to work. Why has he done that? And then as I came to find Divine Truth and I kind of softened into things and became a bit more humble, suddenly I had this desire to actually find out more about what he was doing and why he made those choices and watched a few videos, found a few things from him, references to other videos, and eventually quite quickly decided that in fact, no, there's a lot of, there seems to be a lot of truth in this, uh, this argument for veganism. I, I need to give this a go. So I did. Um, I tried that uh, and said that initially I would just do it for two weeks to see how I felt and ended up sticking with it and, uh, and love it to absolute bits and quite quickly actually got to the emotional reasons, maybe not the whole way down for sure, but got to some of the emotional feelings. Like after those two weeks, I kind of realized like, Hang on, what was I doing this whole time? Like stuffing my face with all this meat. It wasn't doing my body any good. It wasn't doing me any good. And it was, certainly wasn't doing animals or the environment any good. So that's just one example of like where I've been through that process of bringing my own personal truth more alignment with God's. Because God would never, again, it would never consider it loving to kill an animal for the, you know, for the sake of the meal. To kill an animal for any circumstance, in fact. So. Let's talk about humility now. Um, when most people hear humility, they tend to think of it as like a trait or characteristic of a person, like, oh, he's a pretty humble guy or something. And that's not entirely wrong, like, there's, that's, that is true, but it's also a whole lot more than that. As Perry spoke to you about your soul, humility is quite literally like, a, like an organ of the soul. It's a, it's a real, real part of it, and it's something that you can develop and that you can grow. So, again, we could define humility, I'm not going to write this, we could define humility as a passionate desire and longing to feel and experience all of one's emotions fully. So again, it means allowing all the emotions that strike you 
in your in your day to day life, allow them to flow through you. So kind of the way I like to think about this a little is you can, I almost I liken it to, to working out at the gym and trying to trying to build your muscles. Now basically the, the reference I would make is like every time that I choose to be humble and allow my emotions to flow. I'm kind of strengthening my humility muscle. The same way that if you go to a gym and you lift weights and you do this process and repeat it, you're eventually going to get stronger and your muscles will adapt. It's the same with humility. Every time that you're humble and you choose to allow those emotions, your, your humility organ, if you like, of your soul develops and actually you become more and more humble and it's a growing process. On the flip side, on those times that I choose not to be humble and just choose to go to my addictions instead, that's kind of like the days where you think, now nah, you know what, I, I don't feel like working out today, I'm, I'm going to head to McDonald's instead and I'm going to just stuff my face with a load of junk food. Um, and that's kind of what we're doing each time we, we, we don't choose humility and we choose to avoid our feelings and, uh, and sink into our addictions. So humility is a really powerful thing and yeah, I just really encourage everyone to, to give it a go, to you know, try to be as humble as they can at, at each moment. Now, I just want to briefly talk about, in fact there's one example I should just go back to, to kind of pinpoint that with humility again. The example I gave about love and how if somebody triggers you and you were to get angry, yeah, that's where the humble person will go and beat the punch bag, scream into the pillow, where the non-humble person is going to go and perhaps start up an argument with somebody else or whatever it is for them that's going to help them avoid their anger or feeling their emotions basically. So now I just want to talk for a few minutes about how these three things link together and I guess really going back to this quote up here we can add a bit of pretext to it. So if you can't read that it's, it says truth opens the heart so the blood can flow. Now I can't remember Jesus exact words here but it's something to the effect of, I won't put quotation marks around this bit, but humility opens the door for truth to enter. Really going to have to get some practice at writing on whiteboards. <clears throat> Maybe truth and love to enter. Well, then truth opens the heart so that love to enter something. Yeah. yeah. So, the way I kind of like to think about this, it's kind of a little diagram that I thought of. Now, so we've got an upside down triangle. If this is the absolute eureka moment of growth, right, where real growth occurs and you connect with God, then we can have love, truth, and humility. Now, what we're basically saying here is that you can't just skip to the love. You can't, you can't be totally not, not humble and avoiding truth and just go, ah, God, love me. God's going to be there like, well, no, as much, I love you, but you've got to, you know, you need to become humble and learn these truths before you can feel this love. So, we can look at it almost like step one, two, and three here. Yeah. Now, what we're essentially saying with this quote is that humility opens the door for truth to enter. So this is where it all starts. You can't skip humility. You, it's, it's something you really need to develop. Then as you start to allow, once you start to become humble, you allow truth to flow. And you start to then allow yourself to feel some of God's truth on the matter. So it's like me with the veganism thing. Before I wasn't humble enough to even, to even consider watching a video on it. But after finding Divine Truth and I sort of softened into my emotions a little bit, suddenly I was like, no, you know what, I'll watch this stuff and open my, open my eyes to some of the truth. Then once you allow yourself to continue feeling this and the new things that come up, that's when the love can start to flow. And when you allow that to flow and let it continue to flow, this is where you then reach that moment of, ah, this is amazing, this is the point where you'll experience your love from God and you'll actually grow. That's the, that's the point you're trying to get towards. Now, the last thing I want to mention, really, is that one of the things to consider with humility is that it's not necessarily as simple as, ah, I've been humble on this one thing, 
like the veganism thing, uh, I'm a really humble guy now. Like, it doesn't, it's not quite as simple as that. If this is like a, a cross section of the soul, so to speak, and these are all the different like emotional topics, then there'll be thousands more than this. I just can't divide the circle up much more. Let's say you have money, parents, God, partner, and so on. These are all different areas that you've got emotions on inside of your soul, right? Just because you've perhaps opened up, um, you've opened up and become humble with regards to hearing truth about God, does not necessarily mean that you're now suddenly humble with regards to all of your money issues or your parental issues. And it doesn't just translate immediately across the board like that. It's something you've got to work on for all these different areas of your life. And There'll be, there'll be places where you find you have a lot more resistance than others. Um, it's generally going to be due to childhood things. But yeah, this process is essentially the three building blocks to how you're going to develop this relationship with God and grow in love. And like Perry was speaking to you about with regards to soulmates that he briefly touched on, it's the exact same process for growing closer to your soulmate. So allowing yourself to be humble, Allowing yourself to recognize God's truth on the matter and then allowing yourself to feel that love regarding it and to take the loving action. That's not only going to bring you closer to God and allow you to develop that connection and relationship with God, but it's also going to draw you, your soulmate closer and closer into your life every time that you choose to experience um, one of your emotions. And yeah, I think that's, that's pretty much what, what I wanted to share with you guys today. Uh, how are we doing for time? 20 past 11, yeah. It's about right, isn't it? We've, uh, we've run on a little bit, but yeah, I think if uh, we'll just allow a toilet break for anybody that wants to go and stuff now, and then when we come back, we'll do some questions and answers. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Thanks.